गुड मॉर्निंग सर हजदीप दिस साइड फ्रॉम कैन फाउंडेशन यस सर यू मे स्विच ऑन योर वीडियो जस्ट वांटेड टू चेक द ऑडियो एंड वीडियो इफ यू कैन प्लीज यस सर सर द लाइव स्ट्रीमिंग इज ऑलरेडी ऑन ऑन यूट्यूब Okay. Morning, sir. Hi, this side from Ten Foundation. Sorry, so I'll just switch off my uh, mic and screen, and then start at about eleven fifteen. Join back. Sir, you may that... switch on your video. Just wanted to check the audio and video if you can. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You may do. Oh, but you have to find me. Now you've checked my audio and video, sir, right? The live yes, streaming sir. is already on on YouTube. It, it is fine, sir. It is fine. Yes, sir, so I'll just switch off the both, then lo- then uh, switch I'll them just switch off my. Uh, Mic and screen, and then start at about eleven fifteen. Join back. Sir, you may switch on your video. Just uh, yes, sir. Sir, sir. Now you check my audio and video. मॉर्निंग कॉल सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग इज ऑफ सर यू कैन हियर मी सर जस्ट अ सेकेंड तुम अपना म्यूट करो यस सर प्लीज से समथिंग कैन यू हियर मी या क्लियरली क्लियरली and i am visible so i just now switch off my video and my audio and then at 11 11 you'll have, yeah you'll have to stay logged in yeah slightly sir ha huh? to right. the center a little bit yes sir is that fine yeah yeah yes sir is that fine yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. much sir. better much better perfect yeah. so i no no i'll stay logged on uh, siddharth i'm just switching off the audio and the video yeah. and no, i'll sir. join in at 11:15 sharp i'll join back
Can you hear me, guys? Good morning, sir. Good morning, morning. Fine, clear, all good. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Okay. I shall be back. I shall be back. Okay. Take care. I'm getting off now, guys. Okay. Okay, sir. You want me to re remain joined or re exit? And sound may be muted, but uh, you may be there, joined in. Good morning, uh, Khandika, sir. Yes, yes, you are audible. Just wanted to check if, if your audio and video is working well. Oh, baby. Yes, yes, sir, it's, it's fine.
गुड मॉर्निंग अंकित स्वरूप सर सर हर्षदीप दिस साइड हाय हाय हर्षदीप यस सर जस्ट वांटेड टू चेक योर ऑडियो एंड वीडियो इफ दैट्स वर्किंग वेल इट्स फाइन यस यस इट्स फाइन ओके थैंक यू you you can be you can uh, be logged in and then ah. when the session commences you ah, can then switch on, on my uh, video yes and... yes yes that oh. works well okay thanks a lot sir thank you thank you
आपको बोलो ना वीडियो ऑन करें कौन सा आपको मैं बोल रहा हूँ क्या हो गया एक और है ना कर Hi Neeraj. Hi Siddharth, how are you? आपके आपको मैं उस दिन मिस कर गया. You had to catch me after that record, but you got busy. No, no, we have to we have to grab a coffee and something more than a coffee together. फिर बेल्जियम जाना पड़ेगा. How are you, sir? Good morning, sir. Morning, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, sir. sir. I can't see Professor Ved Kumari, so I did get a message from her. Sir, good morning. Morning, sir. I am Aditya Khandekar, advocate practicing in the Madhya Pradesh High Court. On behalf of the Can Foundation, it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to the Second Justice H R Khanna Memorial National Symposium, in collaboration with Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University, Lucknow, and National Law University, Odisha, Kannada. It has been said by Kautilya that the fragrance of flowers spreads only in the direction of the wind, but the goodness of a person spreads in all directions. It is with these words that I would like to introduce our esteemed and distinguished panelists for the first session. Honorable Mr. Justice Vikram Nath, Judge Supreme Court of India, Mr. Neeraj Kishan Kaul, Senior Advocate Supreme Court of India, Mr. Sudhat Luthra, Senior Advocate Supreme Court of India, and I also welcome Professor Subir Bhatnagar, 
Vice Chancellor Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University. Our chief guest for today, Honorable Mr. Justice Vikram Nath, was born on 24th September 1962 in a family that has been contributing to the legal fraternity for the last four generations. Your Lordship enrolled with the Bar Council of Uttar Pradesh on 30th March 1987 and was elevated as an additional judge of the Allahabad High Court on 24th September 2004. Your Lordship took oath as judge of the Allahabad High Court on 27th February 2006 and was elevated as Chief Justice of the Gujarat High Court on 10th September 2019 and elevated as a judge of the Supreme Court on 31st August 2021. Your Lordship has the distinction of being the first Chief Justice of a High Court to live stream court proceedings on YouTube. Your Lordship has made an everlasting imprint through judicial pronouncements. As recent as 16th June 2022, in the case of Krishna Rai versus Banaras Hindu University, your Lordship had to decide the issue as to whether principle of estoppel and acquiescence will prevail over the statutory service rules prescribing the procedure for promotion of class four employees to class three working in the Banaras Hindu University. While allowing the appeal, your Lordship held that the principle of estoppel cannot override the law. Your Lordship as Chief Justice of the Gujarat High Court in Ray uncontrolled upsurge in serious management in COVID control played a pivotal role in ensuring that the state government provided sufficient beds and remdesivir injections and take other equally important measures to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Your Lordship while bidding farewell to the Gujarat High Court had reflected on how important it is for the judiciary to uphold the trust of the people and that the same could only be done with the motto, truth is the highest dharma. It is due to such virtues and a zeal for justice that your Lordship is an inspiration to one and all. It is indeed a great honor to have your Lordship as our chief guest today. Our next panelist, Mr. Neeraj Kishan Kaul, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, is not just a highly admired and brief senior advocate, but is also a patron on, on board at Can Foundation. And it is only due to Mr. Call's constant encouragement and motivation that we are able to conduct events such as the present symposium. Mr. Call graduated from St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi and completed LLB from Campus Law Center, University of Delhi. Mr. Call was awarded the Sukhdevi Girdhari Lal Grover Prize by the University of Delhi for obtaining the highest marks in constitutional law in the university in 1987. Mr. Call has the distinction of being designated as a senior advocate by the Delhi High Court at the young age of 38 years in July 2002. Mr. Call has represented several notable institutions such as the Lok Sabha Secretariat and the Delhi High Court and is one of the most brief counsels in commercial matters pertaining to arbitration, company law, contract, corporate insolvency, etc. in the Supreme Court and various high courts. Mr. Call has also assisted the courts as an amicus curiae in a number of matters pertaining to social welfare, such as court on its own motion versus Municipal Corporation of Delhi, where the Delhi High Court took measures for prevention and cure of dengue. Mr. Call also was also a part of the Indian delegation to participate in the discussion on alternative dispute resolution mechanism and management of court cases at the trial and the appellate court level with the American delegation comprising judges of the Supreme Court of the USA, circuit court judges and federal district and district court judges. Our next panelist, Mr. Sudhat Lusa, senior advocate, has been our patron on board since the very inception of Can Foundation. We owe immense gratitude for the trust placed in us. Mr. Lusa was designated as a senior advocate in 2007 and was appointed as an additional solicitor general, during which time he represented the government in variety of matters, including criminal constitution, human rights, and environmental issues. Mr. Luthra has several feathers in his cap during his illustrious career spanning over three decades. Mr. Luthra has also assisted the Supreme Court as an amicus curiae in the matter of criminal, criminalization of politics and has also pay, played a key role as a member of the Delhi State Legal Service Authority and Supreme Court Legal Service Committee. Due to Mr. Luthra's vast knowledge and experience, he is also a renowned name in the field of academics as well. Mr. Luthra is a resource person and one of the faculties at Delhi Judicial Academy. He is the vice president of Indian Criminal Justice Society and sits on the advisory board of legal journals such as the Delhi Law Times and the Delhi Reported Judgment. 
Mr. Lufra is also a visiting professor in Northumbria University at Newcastle United Kingdom. Mr. Lufra has several notable publications to his credit on various pertinent social legal issues and is also part of the organizing committee of the prestigious international KK Luthra Memorial Moot Court Competition, which takes place every year in the memory of his late father, who was also an eminent senior advocate of national repute and recognition. I would also like to introduce and welcome Professor Subir Bhatnagar, Vice Chancellor Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University, Lucknow. Sir, it is only due to your guidance and support that today's event has become possible. Professor Bhatnagar completed his LLM from Kurukshetra University and PhD in law from Rohtak University, Haryana. He has served as Dean Law and Acting Vice Chancellor of Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar University in 2001 and 2007. Professor Bhatnagar has a rich teaching experience of over four decades. He was also the member of the first academic council of the National Law School of India University, Bangalore in 1987 and was nominated by the Chief Justice of India as a member of the Executive Council of the Indian Law Institute in 2006. Professor Bhatnagar has contributed to several leading law institutes in the country, such as the Himachal Law University and the Assam National Law University. He has published over three dozen papers across reputed journals. Professor Bhatnagar has greatly contributed to development of legal aid and legal literacy programs by delivering several talks on legal and other issues on All India Radio. I would also like to introduce Mr. Tariq Khan. Mr. Khan is presently working as the Registrar of the International Arbitration and Mediation Center, Hyderabad. He was previously a partner at Advani Law and is a professor at Nalsa University of Law. He has the distinction of authoring several books, including a commentary on arbitration law. And due to his vast contribution, SEC Online has recognized him as an arbitration expert. It is also important to introduce some of our members of the CAN Foundation. I would start with Mr. Siddharth Radhilal Gupta, our Chief Executive Officer at CAN Foundation. He is an advocate practicing in the Supreme Court of India and Madhya Pradesh High Court with a vast experience of over 15 years. Mr. Gupta is an alumnus of NLIU Bhopal. Mr. Ankit Swaroop is an advocate of record in the Supreme Court. He graduated from Nal Nalsa Inst University of Law in the year 2009 and enrolled with the Bar Council of Delhi. In the past decade, he has argued several matters which have been reported in legal journals. Mr. Swaroop mainly practices in the Supreme Court of India, Delhi High Court, and tribunals such as NCLAT, Aptel, and NGT. Ms. Bhavna Chandak is an associate at Kachwaha and Partners New Delhi, and she has a keen interest in arbitration law. She graduated from Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab, in 2020, and serves as additional director of philanthropy at Cannes Foundation. Uh, lastly, I would have been uh, communicated that uh, Mr. Call, due to a bereavement in the family, would be required to leave at 1 p.m. So I would request the panelists to take note that he would be leaving at 1 p.m. With this, I open the session. Mr. Ankit Swaroop. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. It is my privilege to invite Professor Subir K. Bhatnagar for his welcome address. Thank you very much. Very good morning. Namaskar to everyone. I have the honor to welcome Honorable Mr. Justice Vikram Nathji, the judge of the Supreme Court of India. Lordship has a close connection with the city of Lucknow as he obtained the basic of law from this city. On behalf of RML NLU and on my personal behalf, I extend a very heartily welcome to you, sir. I have great privilege in welcoming Mr. Neeraj Kishan Kaur, the senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India, 
He masters the experience of working on both the sides, that is the bar and bench. He is an expert in the matter related to commercial and constitutional laws. I, on behalf of the RML NLU, extend a warm welcome to you on this virtual platform. I have great pleasure in welcoming the senior advocate of the Supreme Court, Mr. Siddharth Guthra. He is a well-known expert on criminal laws. I, on behalf of RML NLU and on my personal behalf, extend a warm welcome to you, sir. I welcome my colleague, Professor Vith Kumari, Vice Chancellor, NLU Odisha. I also welcome Mr. Siddharth Gupta, CEO of Ten Foundations, Mr. Tariq Khan, Mr. Ankit Saroop, Mr. Aditya Khandekar, Sneha Bhavna, and all CAN, CN, CAN volunteers and well wishers. I welcome all the delegates and attendees present on this platform. The theme of this session, fundamental duties vis-a-vis -vis fundamental rights under our constitution is very apt for discussion in the present times of our India. There has always been an emphasis on fundamental rights since long, since beginning, I can say. But the fundamental duties are also equally important. If you can recall, Lord Krishna in Gita says, Karmane Vadhikaraste. You have a right to perform your prescribed duties. The American president, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy said, ask what you can do for your country. But we should also not forget Adolf Hitler of Nazi Germany, who had the similar sentiments and exhorted the Germans to do their duties for the nation, towards the nation, towards the race also. The grim reminders of history need to be retained in our memory. We know that man is born free, but he is in chains everywhere. What does it mean? What are these chains? It means that man lives in society with certain restrictions. These restrictions may be in the form of morality. When men started living in the society, they retained their freedoms, their rights, but certain duties were also imposed on them. They are self-imposed duties. They were recognized as moral obligations or civil responsibilities. Therefore, fundamental duties stem or originate in these moral obligations and responsibilities. The genesis and existence of each society depends upon these self-developed, self-realized, and self-accepted duties. Therefore, it may be far from truth to say that only ancient Indian society was based on duties on this planet. Other societies were and still are also based on duties. But the particular aspect of duty as dharma was not realized by their intellectuals, or we can say their leaders, or we can say that dharma as a spiritual value has not been emphasized in their literature, in their cultures. We know that in ancient times, the Indian society was very well advanced compared to other societies on the earth. That's why we say that we were duty-based societies. I can recall that when these uh, duties were inserted, in our constitution in 1976, I was a student of LLM and I was taught constitutional law by a retired chief justice of Assam and Nagaland High Court, Justice Honorable Justice Aske Datta. And he was a retired ICS officer also. So when these duties uh, were inserted and when he, were, he was teaching, I can recall what did he say, that these duties are bhankam, bogus, it has no meaning. How can they find place in the constitution? But after 1976, much water has flowed down Gomti and Yamna, and we find 
that the fundamental duties are being interpreted in consonance with fundamental rights. In Keshwanand Bharti in 1973, he talked about the balance between fundamental rights and directive uh, principles of state policy. Now <coughs> it is time to talk about harmony and balance among fundamental rights, fundamental duties, and directive uh, principles of state policy. So in the end, I can say that this particular theme is very apt because now we are talking about sedition also. There is fundamental duty not to promote disaffection towards the government, which has been constitutionally established. It is a citizen's duty not to do anything which promotes sedition because there uh, is uh, something like fraternity and brotherhood, dignity, in preamble and in fundamental duties also. So we should not do anything as citizen uh, which promotes sedition. But if we make tougher laws, then there is a possibility that those laws can be misused. So over emphasis on fundamental duties to the extent that in order to promote nationalism and solidarity among all the people, the liberty of the people may be put at the peril, it needs to be seen. With these words, I hand over the mic to Mr. Aditya. Thank you very much. So I would request everyone to uh, stand up and take, take a moment of silence for late Justice H.R. Khanna. Thank you. We now have a PowerPoint presentation on CAN Foundation.
I would now like to invite Mr. Ankit Swaroop to introduce the topic. I think there is a technical problem. Uh, could I invite Honorable Mr. Justice Vikram Nath to begin the address? Namaskar. My good wishes to Dr. Subir Bhatnagar, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Raman Ohloya, National Law University, Lucknow, Dr. Veet Kumari, Vice Chancellor, National Law University, Odisha, Katak, Mr. Neeraj Kishan Call. And Mr. Sudhat Luthra, learned senior advocates, the learned members of the foundation, and the audience in attendance, along with the young students. At the outset, I may thank the Khan Foundation for giving me this honor and the opportunity to be a part of this symposium in the memory of a stalwart of his times, late Justice H.R. Khanna. I still distinctly remember that a few days after my elevation, as a judge of the Allahabad High Court in September 2004, one evening, a very respected and distinguished senior advocate, Sri Ravi Kiran Jain, came over for a curtsy call. He presented the autobiography of late Justice Khanna, neither roses nor thorns. He wished me all the best in my new career and also expressed that it was his cherished wish that I should be a judge like Justice Khanna. I had no idea then that today I would be delivering an address in the National Symposium held in the memory of late Justice H.R. Khanna. I would suggest and recommend all of my young friends that if they have not read the autobiography, neither roses nor thorns, they must find time at the earliest. Rabindranath Tagore, in his classic patriotic poem, Ekla Chalore, penned, I quote, if nobody responds and comes forward to your call, then you proceed alone, move alone, march forward alone, unquote and truer words have not been written. Justice Ajar Khanna's legacy continues to be the bastion of our cherished ideals of right to life and liberty. During his tenure, he delivered various judgments which have left an indelible impact on our constitutional jurisprudence. It is said that the darkest of times are the truest tests of character. The emergency was one of the most fateful events in the history of our nation when human rights of citizens were being trampled at the altar of despotism. Justice Khanna's carefully crafted dissent was not only a beacon of hope in those dismal times, but it was also an avant-garde approach towards the understanding of fundamental rights, wherein he held that the constitutional provisions function only as safeguards for existing natural rights and the right to life and liberty precedes the constitution itself. Justice H.R. Khanna was a man so steadfast in his character and belief that no fear or favor was strong enough to deviate him from the pious duty he owed to the constitution and the citizens of India. He truly has set a stellar standard for the succeeding generation of judges to oppose the forces of tyranny, regardless of the personal cost one has to pay. His courageous lone dissent in the famous ADM Jamalpur case or the habeas corpus case is a testament to the fact that titles may not survive the ravages of time, but it is the substance of character which makes us truly legendary. According to the Bhagavad Gita, practicing nishkam karma, selfless action, is the true essence of duty. The remarkable life of Justice H.R. Khanna has been the most authentic example of this very philosophy. We must internalize and reminisce Justice H.R. Khanna's insurmountable courage and commitment to the idea of rule of law and judicial independence to embolden the present and future generation of lawyers and judges 
to brilliantly protect the core of our much revered constitutional values. I had an occasion to have a sitting in court number two on the very first day post my elevation to the Supreme Court. When I looked at the portrait of Justice Khanna, I felt dwarfed by what he contributed by the sheer dent of his promise to the Constitution as a judge of the Supreme Court of India. In the atmosphere of the ongoing debate on the extent of freedoms guaranteed to individuals under our Constitution, I feel the topic suggested for me to speak on is immensely pertinent. Granville Austin, a renowned scholar of the Indian Constitution, and one of his treatises on Constitution states, I quote, even the best of well-drafted constitutions will fail if the people administering them do not have the intentions to implement it, and even the worst of constitutions, badly drafted, will successfully endure if the people are cognizant of their responsibilities, unquote. As human beings, we stand apart from millions of all other species in the universe. What sets us apart from the rest of the living beings is not the gift of language or invention, but the gift of conscious and cognitive capacity, which empowers us to distinguish between right and wrong. Unlike all other living beings on earth, our sensory organs can receive information, analyze it, and thereafter determine what is right and what is wrong. This conscious and cognitive capacity has been the starting point of the great civilization of mankind, the cradle of many of which has been our nation. Since the age of civilization, human beings have always tried to preserve human liberty so as to ensure an effective social and democratic life and a free play for all. Philosophers such as Locke and Rousseau have traced the concept of human rights. According to Locke, I quote, man is born with a title to perfect freedom and an uncontrolled enjoyment of all the rights and privileges of the law of nature. And he has by nature a power to preserve his property, that is his life, liberty and estate against the injuries and attempts of other men, unquote. As Pandit Nehru said, I quote, Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom, unquote. The framers of our constitution knew the importance of freedom, which can only be ensured by providing basic fundamental rights to each and every citizen of this country as enshrined in part three of the constitution. Another essential reason to incorporate fundamental rights in our constitution was the diverse population we have. Our society is fragmented into many religious, cultural and linguistic groups. And in order to ensure a sense of security, confidence, and most importantly, equality, the basic fundamental rights were introduced. However, Fundamental right is only one of the pillars of the Constitution and it cannot stand alone. It has to be read with fundamental duties enshrined in part 4A of our Constitution. In actuality, the chariot of life is propelled forward by two wheels, rights and duties. If rights and duties coexist and strengthen one another, we can attain the ultimate purpose which rights and duties serve, a welfare society, and hence, exercising one's rights also entails respecting the rights of others. The foundational pillars of any long-lasting civilization have been the duties of the citizens towards each other from which rights emanate, which balances the dynamics of the necessities of the individuals and aspirations of the collective. What is the right of an individual? Maybe the collective duty of others owed to him. Likewise, what may be the duty of an individual towards the collective? Maybe vital for the greatest enjoyment of rights by another set of individuals. It would be a deeply flawed thinking if any person feels that his rights trump that of the collective. In proper balancing of both, duty towards the social structure comes first, followed by assertion of personal rights with respect to our contemporaries. The very existence of rights 
is a sequitur to the acknowledgement and performance of duties by others. And for this reason, I am always of the firm view that duties have forever preceded the existence of rights in any era, in any society. One may talk of the Indus Valley civilization, the Mahajanapadas, or the Magad civilization. The edifice of all these were built on strong foundations of collective and conscious commitment of members of the civilization to achieve the common good, universal welfare, and public benefit. The era of globalization has ushered in a digital revolution, which has changed the way we think and act. Our Prime Minister has time and again stressed upon the approach of thinking globally but acting locally, implying that our vision must be to compete globally whilst being equally concerned about the interests and rights of all those around us in our country. The word locally has immense significance attached to it, which means when we take our international goals forward, the domestic interests should not be lost sight of. The dynamic field of law is touching every aspect of human life and livelihood. Therefore, the discourse of comprehending one's duties has become all the more prominent and significant. The concept of duties has deep roots in Indian civilization, where the whole societal setup is based on the traditional concept of dharm for ages and centuries. Dharm is a set of one's duties and obligations towards his family, his near and dear ones, his society, and eventually his nation. The oft-quoted saying, which the new generation has chosen to forget, I quote, Janani Janma Bhumishya Swargadapi Gariyasi, unquote, was originated from Sri Ramayana. When translated, it means mother and motherland are superior even to heaven. This quote emphasizes the duties we owe as a son of the soil and the land we are born in. The legal treatises of ancient India called Dharma Shastras contain codified versions of the initial emergence of law from religion in Central and South Asia, explaining dharma as a set of sacred obligations owed to different classes and sects of society. Sri Bhagavad Gita, under chapter 2, slope 47, mentions, I quote, Karmane vadhikaraste ma faleshu kadachana, ma karma falehe tu bhurmate sangosta karmadi, unquote. This means you only have a right to action and not to the fruits of it. Do not become a person who constantly meditate upon the results of one's karma. Do not get attached to inactivity. This verse of Sri Bhagavad Gita is the foundation of duties of humankind. A confluence of karma and dharma would lead to an inescapable conclusion that the performance of karma by every citizen of society detached from the result is quintessential for the very existence and survival of the society. Thus, we have a collective duty of every citizen towards the larger welfare of the society. In a way, we are talking of a social state where every individual surrenders his part of the right for acknowledgement and recognition of the good and welfare of another. Sri Rabindranath Tagore, also in the famous collection of his Bangla poem, Gitanjali, published in 1910, said, I quote, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, into that heaven of freedom, my father let my country awake, unquote. This pre-independence poem by one of our nation's greatest thinkers is the realization of a dream where countrymen awake and enjoy a life full of dignity and honor whilst being respectful towards each other. In fact, all these poems, ideas, and writings of great thinkers like Sri Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi are the bedrock of Article 51A of the Constitution of India. Moving on to international treatises, documents, conventions, and other relevant materials, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, through its Article 29.1, also underscores that, I quote, everyone has the duties to the community, 
in which alone the free and full development of the personality is possible." Unquote. The draft Declaration of Rights and Duties of States prepared in 1949 also provides for a set of codified universal duties, including the responsibilities that one state or country owes to another. The preamble to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights 1996 also acknowledges, I quote, that an individual is under a responsibility to strive for the promotion and observance of the rights recognized in the present covenant because he has a duty to other individuals and to the community to which he belongs, unquote. When we look at the international scenario, all the developed countries give a premium to duties over individual rights. For example, in Australia, Greece and Cyprus, there is an explicit duty to vote under the constitution, failure of which is punishable. Likewise, the Japanese constitution lays greater emphasis on duties and imposes a duty to pay taxes to bear the burden of education of the lower strata of citizens. There is also a compulsory obligation to work for a minimum period of hours for every citizen. Not to forget, civic responsibilities are enforced as codified laws in Japan. I must also quote the Ugandan constitution wherein the duty to uphold and defend the constitution in support of democracy and rule of law is inherently imbibed. China has enforced unique duties such as the duty to practice family planning and to compulsorily rear and educate children born in a family. The children in turn, after becoming independent, are obliged to maintain, support, and assist their parents. Examples are numerous, spanning from US to the UK to the USSR. One can go on and on, elaborating the constitutions across the globe, imbibing fixed set of duties in one form or the other. Article 15A in our constitution is the repository of the duties inserted through the 42nd Amendment of 1976, also known as the mini constitution Article 51A, occurring under Part 4A, was preceded by Sardar Swaran Singh Committee Report in 1976. This report emphasized that rights cannot be divorced from duties and that the former stem only from the duties performed. The report further went on to note that if one man's right is to be consistent with another man's right, that can be so only by the acceptance of corresponding duties by both the men. Post the 42nd Amendment, the then Law Minister Sri Achar Gokhale stated that fundamental duties were meant to have, I quote, a sobering effect on these restless spirits who have had a host of anti-national, subversive and unconstitutional agitations, unquote. Gokhale also revered fundamental duties as a poem embodying noble ideas, rhythm, and harmony. Fundamental duties have always preceded rights, and they have to be seen in their entirety. The Supreme Court of India, also in a host of judgments, has reiterated the same view. In a case relating to illegal limestone mining in Uttarakhand, namely, Rural Litigation and Entitlement, Kendra and others versus State of Uttar Pradesh, the bench presided by Justice Ramanath Mishra held, I quote, preservation of the environment and keeping the ecological balance unaffected is a task which not only governments, but also every citizen must undertake. It is a social obligation. And let us remind every Indian citizen that it is his fundamental duty as enshrined in Article 51A G of the Constitution, unquote. Similar was the view echoed in the cases of Sachidanand Pandey versus State of West Bengal, M. C. Mehta versus Union of India. Further, in the landmark judgment of the Ramila Maidan incident, relying on the report of the National Commission to review the working of the Constitution, the Supreme Court held, I quote, the political, social, and economic philosophy of the Constitution is reflected in the preamble of the Constitution, which declares India a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. The preamble 
read with the directive principles of state policy, presents the socio-economic goals of the constitution. Fundamental rights and fundamental duties are the means by which the socio-economic goals of the constitution are to be realized." Unquote. Here, I would like to share with the distinguished audience my experience at the helm of affairs of the Gujarat High Court during the first phase of COVID-19, beginning March 2020. The spread of COVID-19 had taken everyone by surprise. No one was aware of its roots, nor the manner with which it was to be dealt with or controlled. All of a sudden, a nationwide lockdown was imposed for the protection and safety of life. The government had an uphill task, immeasurable in size, to handle the situation. In a couple of weeks, it was well registered that everyone had to take care of himself to protect from this virus, and in doing so, would also be protecting the rest of the family, friends, relatives, and neighborhoods. The government was trying its best to implement the lockdown as per the SOP, and everyone else was trying to provide and ensure basic amenities for themselves and the family. In the process, there were rampant instances where the SOPs would be violated, resulting into further spread of the deadly virus. The courts all over the country had taken up this cause to appeal to the state and also to the citizenry to do its best in order to maintain and adhere to the SOPs. On the one hand, the court was desperately trying to enforce the fundamental rights of the people who were suffering at large, and at the same time, requesting them to fulfill their obligation of adhering to their fundamental duties so as to strike a balance between rights and the duties. Before the Gujarat High Court, the bench hearing the PIL relating to COVID-19 was being monitored by a bench presided by me and brother Justice J.V. Pardiwala, the chief speaker for the second session as my bench partner. We had made repeated appeals requested with folded hands, duly incorporated in our orders to the public at last to make sure that the SOPs as framed from time to time were not violated and strictly adhered to. We issued several directions to the state government for the benefit of the public at large who was facing difficulties. Innumerable directions were issued relating to implementation of fundamental rights of education, life, liberty, speech, equality, religion, and livelihood. We were further trying to remind the fundamental duties to the different stakeholders involved in the process who could help those who were suffering. What I mean to say is that the enforcement of fundamental rights, the citizens can approach the courts. However, for performance of fundamental duties, there can be no enforcement under law. It has to be self-inculcated, self-understood, and implemented. I would say that first it should be the duty which we should fulfill before expecting any rights to be respected. Rights and duties are intrinsically linked and cannot be separated from each other. Both function together as they are the two sides of the same coin. A citizen of India has the right to life, but the Indian constitution also places duties on him to respect a pe other people's lives and to avoid putting his own in risk. The existence of duties allows for the enjoyment of rights. There is a fundamental duty for each basic right and in case if a person doesn't carry out his the responsibilities, public duties, the concept of rights and duties to have a welfare and peaceful society renders meaningless. I would like to conclude with the celebrated quote of the famous American historian Russell Kirk. I quote, every right is married to a duty, every freedom owes a corresponding responsibility, unquote. I appreciate the efforts of the Khan Foundation for organizing the series of lectures in the memory of late Justice Achar Khanna, who himself, as a mark of his duty towards the Constitution, never cared about the post of the Chief Justice of India and throughout was driven by his conscience. I am humbled by a deep respect for such a pious soul. Before I end, I thank Mr. Neeraj Kishan Kaul and Mr. Siddharth Luthra, the Senior Council, for joining the session. I have been told that they are supporting the education for number of scholars every year through the Khan Foundation. According to me, it is the bounden duty of every Sikh successful senior counsel of the country to support the next generation of lawyers who are financially deterred from joining our glorious and noble profession. I would be failing in my duty if I were not to mention the laudable efforts of the Khan Foundation, 
its team of scholars, associates, and all stakeholders, especially young students connected with the foundation in organizing this symposium in such a meticulous, efficient, and fruitful manner. I must also applaud the Cannes Foundation for its flagship projects, namely Project Tech Love, which caters to the underprivileged students to overcome their financial hardship, and Project Dhananjay for providing stipends to the new entrants in the profession. With this, I close my address and pass on the baton to the distinguished experts on the subject for further deliberation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your golden words um, and for reminding us of Ekla Chalore by Rabindranath Tagore, that is to walk alone if required on the path of justice. Honorable Justice Vikramnath very rightly pointed that the darkest of times are the truest test of character. And sir very lucidly mentioned that the right of an individual may be collective duties of others and highlighted the importance of balancing the both rights and duties. And this reminds me of Justice Khanna, who is renowned for setting an example during the period that has been called the darkest hour of Indian democracy during the period of emergency, a mark of his duty towards the constitution. Uh, sir also mentioned about enforcement and implementation of the fundamental rights and also gave reference of COVID-19 and this reminds me of Justice Krishna Iyer's golden words in the case of Somprakash Shriki versus Union of India, when he said that the court cannot connive at a process which eventually will make fundamental rights as rare as roses in December and ice in June. Thank you once again, sir, for enlightening us and emphasizing on the walking in the way of righteousness and taking the path of justice. Now, may I request learned senior advocate Neeraj Kishan calls G to take us further in the session. Justice Nath, my very dear friend Siddharth Luthra, Professor Bhatnagar, Dr. Ved Kumari, Siddharth Gupta, other members of the CAN and distinguished members and viewers. Justice Nath touched upon the life of Justice Khanna. And truly, Justice Khanna was a man of stellar character and integrity a judge whose contribution to strengthening the rule of law in India is unparalleled. His dissent in ADM Jabalpur would rank amongst the greatest dissents in constitutional law anywhere in the world. A judge who stood up against the tyranny of the state to uphold the most valuable guaranteed rights of a citizen under the constitution. And truly, if there was a man who performed his duty to uphold the rights of the citizens, it was Justice H.R. Khanna. Now coming to the subject at hand, fundamental duties are the guiding principles of citizens to perform their duties and be responsible towards the state. They play an important role in India, seek to achieve set of parameters of progress, which cannot be achieved without citizens performing their duties. That is really the social, moral, and polit political construct and notion of duties which are expected from citizens. A question then arises as to whether would this hold good viewed from the prism of constitutional principles which protect fundamental rights. So let's start by looking at what the duties under the constitutional framework were as the constitution originally stood. There was no chapter on fundamental duties in the constitution that came into effect on 26th of January 1950. The framers of the constitution had not included duties separately, perhaps in the belief that citizens would not only be well aware of them, but would be conscious enough to follow them. However, even at that point in time, there existed a Gandhian view of the constitution and Gandhi had said, I quote, the true source of rights is duty. If we all discharge our duties, rights will not be far to seek, unquote. So much so that a Gandhian constitution of free India was released in 1946. The Gandhian constitution co-joined fundamental rights and fundamental duties. It was quite rare in Indian constitution thinking, including the formal constitution making process that time to condition exercise of rights on adherence to duties. Apart from one or two instances where members of the constituent assembly echoed Gandhian idea on rights and duties, we really find no evidence that suggests that the framers of our constitution seriously considered adopting something that resembled fundamental duties in the constitution, even if had moral and political convictions about the importance of duties. 
It was only Sir Aladi Krishna Swami Iyer who referred to the concept of yagna, I sacrifice, and pointed out the importance of social duties. Also, the idea of fundamental duties at that time was to be find, found only in the Basic Law of West Germany of 1949 and the 1972 Constitution of the Soviet Union. The Supreme Court recognized the Supreme Court of India recognized the concept of duties much before they were formally added to the constitutional scheme. The Supreme Court engaged with the duties owed to the state in 1969, much before the 42nd Amendment was passed. In Chandra Bhavan boarding case, the Supreme Court emphasized the Constitution conceives of both rights and duties. The court read the provisions of Part Four of the Constitution, that is, the Directive Principles of State Policy, as giving the state the power to impose duties on citizens, connecting the imposition of duties to the achievement of Directive Principles. And the Supreme Court observed. And I quote: "It is a fallacy to think that under our constitution there are only rights and no duties. The provision in Part Four relating to directive principles enables the legislature to impose various duties on the citizens." Unquote. The court also remarked that the mandate of the constitution was to build a welfare society, and that this objective may be achieved to the extent that the directive principles are implemented by the legislation. Fundamental duties were incorporated. In Part Four A of the Indian Constitution, by the Forty Second Amendment, on the recommendations of the Sardar Swaran Singh Committee, and the Eleventh Duty was added to the Ten Fundamental Duties by the Eighty Sixth Amendment. The new part had been added following the recommendations of the Sardar Swaran Singh Committee, which suggested that steps needed to be taken to ensure that the individual did not overlook his duties while in exercise of his fundamental rights. One can't also forget that this observation and proposal came during the height of emergency era, and that had its own political undertones to it. The committee had gone to the extent of recommending punishment for breach of such duties, but the suggestion was not accepted by the drafters of the amendment. Article fifty one a begins by stating that it shall be the duty of every citizen of India, and then proceeds to identify ten and now eleven areas where such duties must be followed. This includes abiding by the constitution and respecting its ideals and institutions, safeguarding public uh, property, and abjuring violence, and upholding and protecting the sovereignty, unity, and integrity of India, etc. In the debate on the bill in a session devoted to the amendment in November 1976, no one objected to the insertion of the fundamental. Now let's have a look at the recent discourse on fundamental rights vis-a-vis fundamental duties. the popular jurisprudence behind the relation of right and duty provides that the two components are inseparable one school of thought is that rights can be enjoyed only in the world of duties when the people fail to discharge their duties properly the rights also become meaningless the other school of thought is that though the two components may be inseparable they are not conditioned upon conditional upon each other fulfillment of one cannot be a condition for fulfillment of the other to my mind the answer lies somewhere between the two positions in the case of state of rajasthan versus union of india the supreme court stated and i quote legal rights in the strict sense are correlatives of legal duties and legal rights are defined as the interests which the law protects by imposing duties on other persons but the legal right in the strict sense means right is the immunity from the legal power of another immunity is no subjection at all and in javed versus the state of haryana the supreme court held that fundamental rights have to be read with fundamental duties and directive principles of state policy and they cannot be read in isolation this was followed further in ramleela maidan incident by the supreme court observing and i quote there has to be a balance and proportionality between right and restriction on the one hand and the right and duty on the other it will create an imbalance if due, due if undue or un, uh, disproportionate emphasis is placed upon the right of a citizen without considering the significance of the duty the majority of the 42nd amendment was struck down by the 44th amendment leaving fundamental duties untouched thereby indicating that even then how essential fundamental duties were held to be now putting a question to myself and to the audience is there really a contradiction and what would be the way forward the debate very often assumes that fundamental rights are on a collision course with fundamental duties this may not be necessarily true 
the primary source of debate and the two viewpoints is mainly the lack of legal backing to the fundamental duties. In that sense, they are similar to directive principles of state policy. The difference is that while directive principles are addressed to the state, the fundamental duties are individual centric. However, it is important to note that some duties are protected by law and already are being enforced through ordinary law. For example, there are laws available on offenses against the state in the Indian Penal Code, which protects any activity disrupting sovereignty and integrity of India. But some duties mentioned in Article 51A appear to be legally unenforceable for their vast and imprecise nature. The duties contained, for instance, in Clause B, F, H, and J do not express any ideas or ideals, nor appear to be capable of legal enforcement. Hence, they can be regarded as directory or aspirational. In Bijoy Emanuel versus the State of Kerala, the court clarifies that there is no violation of Article 51A when a person shows no disrespect, uh, disrespect to the national anthem, and if he, she stands up respectfully when the national anthem is sung, but does not join the singing. The scope of Article 51A was extended in Ashok Kumar Thakur versus Union of India by Justice Bandari and was and said that the state is all the citizens placed together and hence through Article 51A does not expressly cast any fundamental duty on the state. The fact remains that the duty of every citizen of India is the collective duty of the state. In an interesting observation from the AP High Court in Dr. Dasarathi versus State of Andhra Pradesh, the court held that under Article 51A, subclause J of Part 4A, it is the duty of every citizen to strive towards excellence in all spheres of life and also for the collective activity. Thus, the nation continuously rises to a higher level of endeavor and achievements. For this reason, the state can permit and provide ways to achieve excellence according to the methods which are mentioned in the Indian Constitution. One can readily infer from all these above decisions that the judiciary has attempted to balance the equation between rights and duties. However, the importance of rights has not been diluted at all. We must not forget that we are a rights-based society and nation. It is said that yielding to right-based politics makes democracy more stable. It further its legitimization with the masses and situates its actions in the context of constitutionality. Indeed, the framers of our constitution were of the same view and hence the right-centric liberal constitution was envisaged. The right way to look at the issue is the structure in which duties bind citizens. A citizen owes some duties directly to its fellow citizens and some duties directly to the state. Take, for example, it can't be accepted that while exercising fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression and also to assemble peacefully, a group of protesters vandalizes public property and private dwellings. In doing so, not only the duty to the state is being infringed, but the duty to a fellow citizen is also being violated. Sometimes the duty enumerated for a citizen go hand in hand with the larger constitutional objective that the state has to fulfill, as well as protection of individual rights. Sometimes fundamental rights can act as a soft power in safeguarding vulnerable minority individual rights against social majorities. Article 51 AE talks about promoting harmony and common brotherhood. This very much echoes the idea of fraternity mentioned in the preamble and is also an aspiration towards safeguarding minority rights. An interesting thing to note is that some of these rights and duties are also mostly overlapping each other. As an oft quoted example, Article 21A of the Indian Constitution under Part 3 talks about the right to education that is fundamental to every citizen of the country. Similarly, Article 51AK under Part 4A of the Constitution states how every parent or guardian figure of a child should provide educational opportunities for the child from the ages of six years to 14 years. Therefore, both the rights and duties have worked together towards securing the right to education of a child between the ages of six and 14. As part of the social contract, since the state protects and enforces rights, it also becomes the duty of all citizens to undertake duties which further the constitutional principles and aspirations of a state. It is their duty to obey the laws of the state and to pay taxes honestly. Thus, a citizen has both rights and duties. He enjoys rights and performs his duties. Rights and duties, to my mind, are the two sides of the same coin. In this sense, the citizen is expected to his own monitor while exercising 
enforcing his fundamental rights, remembering that he owes the duties specified in Article 51A to the state as some sort of a self-contained code. The repercussions of not following these duties may be felt by the next generation, which may then be faced with an eventuality of curbing some of the rights, contracting of some constitutional principles, or higher, higher penal covenants, the social contract between the state and the citizen. It is in this manner that the equation of rights is a duty that impacts citizens, and that's a situation which should always be avoided. Having said so, we must remember that the essence of the Constitution is all about rights. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar had spoken in the Constituent Assembly about how the fundamental unit of the Constitution remains the individual. Neither Article 32 nor Article 226 makes it a condition for the citizen to satisfy their bona fides about the fun fulfillment of fundamental duties. Respectfully, non-fulfillment of duties cannot be a threshold test or maintainability issue while exercising or enforcement a fundamental right. It may be necessary condition in adjudicating the bona fides and prejudices at a later stage. Neither can duties outweigh enforcement of fundamental rights. Outside the constitutional ethos and judicial system, it's entirely a question of self-contained code. To conclude, as the famous Hofeldian analysis goes, a right is a legal interest that imposes a correlative duty. If each one of us, including the state, respects that correlative duty in respect of others' rights, I think the fine balance shall continue to benefit us. The debate, to my mind, should be viewed and answered in this slide. I'm very, very grateful for giving me this opportunity. And I would take leave of Justice Nath, and I had mentioned there is something I have to attend. Very, very grateful for having invited me. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for taking us through the contribution of Justice Khanna in strengthening the rule of law. A judge who stu stood up against the tyranny of the state and performed his duties to enforce fundamental rights of the citizens. Sir has enlightened us today about Gandhian idea on rights and duties, that the true source of right is duty. And if we all discharge our duties, right will not be far to seek. Sir also took us through the series of decisions to explain the fundamental duties and how duties bind citizens by giving examples of how some duties are towards fellow citizens and some towards the state. Thank you so much, sir. You are truly an inspiration for young lawyers. And now may I request uh, Mr. Siddharth Luthra, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, to address the participants. Sir has been a mentor uh, to a lot of people, including me. I had the privilege to intern with sir. I'm truly excited to hear you, sir. Thank you, Tarek. Honorable Justice Vikram Nath, my dear, dear friend and senior colleague, Neeraj Kaul, Professor Bhatnagar, Professor Ved Kumari, Tarek, Siddharth Gupta, other panelists, and members of the audience. Justice Khanna was a beacon of light at a time of darkness. We were confronted in a situation where our, our rights were being subrogated, where citizens feared for their liberty. And at that point of time, there was one man who stood up to uphold the constitution. And as Justice Nath said, his portrait hangs in court two and not in court one. And that was a conscious choice he made. I would, again, as Justice Nath said, commend all my young colleagues and friends to read his autobiography. I had the occasion to deliver uh, a memorial lecture in his memory a few years ago. And at that stage, I had occasion to read his uh, autobiography. And it's a fascinating story of how he knew the fate that would befall him. And yet, he was true to his conviction. In fact, he tells his sister, he says, I know this is going to happen, but I'm, I'm happy and resigned to it. And therefore, it just shows that we need individuals like him to make this country or any nation a far better place. Now to come to the topic of the day, you know, this whole issue of fundamental rights is based on a philosophy introduced in the constitution, never there originally, that every right has a corresponding duty. Just as Nath and Neeraj all refer to the Ram Dila case. And the point is, as it is stated there, difficult to anticipate a right to freedom or liberty without reasonable restrictions, and equally difficult to imagine the existence of a right 
not coupled with the duty. Now, in the Constitution uh, Assembly, when this conversation on fundamental rights took place, there's a report that comes to be submitted, but the fundamental duties did not form part of the report. Professor Katie Sharp writes a dissent, and I quote, lest the tale of obligations sounds one-sided. I would add that corresponding to, to the rights of citizens, there are also implied or declared obligations of the citizens. There is, I fear, too much talk of rights everywhere and distressing silence in regard to duties. In a modern society where the division of labor or specialization of functions is so widespread and complex, where every individual is necessarily dependent upon the cooperation of his fellows, there cannot be rights only without any mention or thought of duties. Rights and duties must go hand in hand if we are to progress on the right lines. But then again, that was the dissent. And it took another four decades before you had the 42nd Amendment and a new part, part 4A, comes into the Constitution and Article 51 comes in. At that point of time, there was a recommendation of the Swaran Singh Committee and that led to these being brought in. And Shri Gokhale, who was then law minister, proposes the speech, and I quote, and this is 1976, and I quote, it has always been regarded by right-thinking people that you are conscious of your rights, no less important that you must be equally conscious of your duties. It may be that students are told, that children are told what their duties are, it may be that such an education may not only be necessary for children, but also for adults, because it is high time that we read these duties and understand what is the basic principle. Our constitution has been called the cosmopolitan constitution. Why? Because it's, it has a fidelity to the universal principles of liberty, equality, fraternity, and the text principles, its jurisprudence, have been situated at the major cross currents of global constitutions. What is interesting is that the amendment that was brought in to bring in fundamental duties comes in, in line with one, the Article 29, one of the Universal Declaration. And as stated by the speakers before me, constitutions such as Japan, China, and the USSR. Of course, um, there is an interesting article, which I must point out where it is mentioned that the reason for the amendment possibly was at that time that the then prime minister was rather unhappy about the enforcement of rights against her in dissent and the Supreme Court striking down constitutional amendments such as in Keshwanand Bharti. So that led to, and the judgment in Keshwanand Bharti, and that is where, where Justice Khanna was on the bench. And that is what leads to also consideration whether the fundamental duties came in not as originally envisaged, but came in because there was a little angst regarding the way the Supreme Court was upholding human, uh, fundamental rights. Uh, the 86th Amendment to the Constitution has now introduced the last fundamental duty, and that's the right of education, Article 6, and between age 6 and 14, and for parents and guardians to provide opportunities, because while there is Article 21A, it's also important that parents and guardians must cooperate. In my view, fundamental rights are a direct or indirect consequence of a fair assertion of fundamental duties. Part three confers rights, yet duties and restrictions are contained thereunder. These rights are basic in nature, recognized and guarantees as natural rights, inherent in the status of a citizen of a free country, but not absolute and controlled in operation. Each of the rights is to be controlled and curtailed and regulated to a certain extent made by laws, by parliament and duties, as noted in the famous commentary on the constitution by Mr. Basu. In Naveen Jindal's case, this issue came up in the context of the flag, flying the flag. And there it was said that every right is coupled with the duty. And these rights have reasonable restrictions and therefore relying upon part three, apart from clauses two, four, and six of Article 19, the principle was that you can fly the national flag, but it's not a complete, it's not an absolute right, it's a qualified right, and such right can be read with regard to Article 51 of the Constitution. Uh, 
in the slaughtering uh, case that is Mirzapur Gujarat versus Mirzapur Muti Qureshi, Jamaat 2005, it was again asserted that directive principles and fundamental duties must be kept in mind while assessing the reasonableness of legal restrictions placed upon fundamental rights. Though the position of law, of course, as we all know, remains that directive principles and fundamental duties cannot by themselves subserve to invalidate a legislation or policy, but they are now considered a very crucial part of the constitution. The concept of fundamental duties comes from the term dharma. Dharma being in its original sense, the maintenance of peace, security, and the law and order within the larger cosmic order. Observance of dharma gives rise to dharma or dharma gives rise to what one is called, being called as abhyudaya, social welfare through the efficient regulation and control of the physical, politi political, economic, and social environment, while amrita is concerned with nistriyasa or spiritual freedom. While a citizen is an important organ of the state, but to achieve a welfare society, it is important that citizens are not only provided with fundamental rights, breach of which is in the constitution, but fundamental duties to achieve a responsible citizenry and ultimately achieve progress and development in society. Justice Venkat Ramaya, in a lecture on citizenship's rights and duties, the Arkitanka Memorial Lecture 1988 said, and I quote, by way of broad classification, it may be stated that duties mentioned in clause A and B of Article 51 of the Constitution have a nationalistic fervor. By asking all citizens to abide by the Constitution, its ideals and institutions and the symbolic manifestation of those ideals is visual imagery and audition and to cherish the ideas inspiring the struggle for freedom, they seek to ensure that the spirit of nationalism is not forgotten in the heat of partisan or personal controversies. And clause J of Article 51A, he said, lay stress on the excellence in all spheres of individual and collective activity, partly recaptures the high tone of our constitution framework. Fundamental rights cannot be enforced except with the supporting statute existing of the breach, like the director principles, as I stated earlier, there is no specific provision to say that these are part of it. The scheme of fundamental rights and fundamental duties must be seen as one because that's what the constitution envisages, one scheme of creating responsible citizens. Fundamental duties therefore perform an educative role. They have legal value in the sense that any laws which implement fundamental duties cannot be invalid on the ground of conflict with fundamental rights unless the conflict is irreconcilable. Rights, after all, must be reconciled with duties. There was a reference, as I said, made to the Ramlila Maidan incident, and I will not re-quote it, but para 39 was quoted by my friend Neeraj Kaul, and I would all draw your attention to para 40, which talks about the interplay of Article 19 and fundamental duties. In Minerva Mills also, the Supreme Court had held that merely because a rule is not backed by sanctions for breach does not mean it is not important. And this is great relevance in the context of examining the scope of fundamental duties. <clears throat> in fact, in Minerva Mills, there is a wonderful passage which I would like to read to my friends. And just one sentence which reads is under, the crucial test which has to be applied is whether directive principles impose any obligations or duties on the state. If they do, the state will be bound by a constitutional mandate to carry out such obligations or duties, even though no corresponding right is created in anyone which can be enforced in a court of law. Now, there will be many examples, whether it is the Ames case of 2002, which deals with this, but the classic cases and some examples have been quoted by Justice Nath. In the context of animal rights, you have the Animal Welfare Board of India versus A. Nagaraja, which held the right to wildlife, the right to environment, the right to protecting animals, the need to protect animals is part of Article 21 and fundamental duties. Flying the flag, I have already referred to you the case of Naveen Jinder, where it said it's not an absolute right. 
in protecting the environment, you have the 1986 decision of rural litigation and entitlement kendra, which says that, and I quote, preservation of the environment and keeping the ecological balance unaffected is a task which not only governments, but also every citizen must undertake, unquote. Uh, Justice Nath had also referred to the classic case of Sachidanand Pandey, which has a wonderful passage by a red, red Indian American chief, one of the most poignant pieces of literature. And I would all commend to all of you that it's a judgment which you must all visit, revisit and look at that passage. It's one of the most poignant pieces of writing about a person's love for the environment. In education and training, you have Mohan Kumar Singh Hanya's case, which talks about the balance that is to be brought in pollution, well or citizens, the examples are actually very numerous. The fact is that the, there are various legislations now which give teeth to fundamental duties. For example, Article 51 AC, to uphold the sovereignty, unity, and integrity to promote harmony and spirit of common brotherhood. So there are provisions under the Penal Code, Chapter 6, Chapter 7, uh, Chapter 8, all dealing with such issues to protect the environment, 51A, uh, 51 AG, you have provisions in the IPC under the Environmental Protection Act, Wildlife Protection Act, Air Pollution Prevention and Control of Pollution Act, Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act. The fact is that we have now increasingly brought in these provisions because there is a need to sustain life on this earth and life in our society as a balanced life where people's we, where we respect each other. Though it has been argued often that rights and duties are to be linked and they cannot be rights and duties, I must point out that this idea, though mooted at the time of the constitution, didn't really catch traction there. And as I said earlier, it took four decades for it to come. Fundamental duties, of course, will not act as a limitation, but they enhance the purpose of the constitution. We, when we brought in our constitution, we inherited a society which was divided on the basis of religion, caste, community, gender, and therefore we needed the fundamental rights to ensure there was protection for all. Glanville William, and I would like to conclude with this passage, says in his very seminal work on the Indian constitution that the desire for rights was reinforced by the suspicion of government in, in, engendered by colonial rule, suspicion that was certainly not diminished by the scoffing attitude of the imperial government towards rights. Various communities believed that their safety depended upon the inclusion in the constitution of measures protecting their group's rights and characters. In the eyes of the minorities too, the Congress was on trial. During the years when independence had been more of a hope than a reality, the Congress had been loud in demanding written rights with independence and assumption of power to reject rights would have created a vast and crippling suspicion of the leader's motives. The party leadership was eager to demonstrate its intentions and that's where the chapter on fundamental rights was paid great attention to. Unfortunately, at that point, we forgot to add the need, of, the need for fundamental duties. And fortunately, that error has been corrected. Thank you very so much. Thank you so much, sir, for your golden words. We are truly enlightened, and you have rightly said that Justice Khanna was a light in the time of darkness at a time when our rights were being suppressed. Mr. Luthra also very rightly said that we need individuals like Justice Khanna to make any country a better place. Citing the Naveen Jandil case, sir said that every right is coupled with a duty, and that each right has to be reasonably controlled and regulated. Sir also emphasized that to achieve a welfare society, how important are fundamental rights and duties, and that rights and duties must be reconciled. Sir took us through various judgments relating to rights of animals, flying the flag, protection of environment, etc., and suggested that we all must revisit these judgments. Thank you once again very much, sir. Now may I call Ms. Bhavna, member of Can Foundation, to please give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Tarik, sir. It's my honor to be here amongst everyone and I'm privileged to deliver the vote of thanks for today's session. We had the privilege of paying tribute to the legendary Honorable Mr. Justice Hans Raj Khanna, 
whose outstanding work in exemplary sacrifice dwells on the story of a crusader against injustice a legendary judge who lived in work for giving justice to people of india at a time when darkness had engulfed personal liberty the new york times on april 30th 1976 came out with an editorial praising his dissenting opinion in the adm jabalpur case i quote if india ever finds a way back to freedom and democracy that were proud hallmarks of its first 18 years as an independent nation we will surely erect a monument to justice h r khanna of supreme court it was justice khanna who spoke out fearlessly and eloquently for freedom we discussed and elaborated on the relevance and importance of duties that correspond to our fundamental rights in today's session and therefore it reminds me of justice khanna's words in his book making of india's constitution where he said if the indian constitution is a heritage bequeathed to us by our founding fathers no less are we the people of india the trustees and custodians of the values which pulsate within its provisions a constitution is not a parchment paper it is a way of life and has to be lived up to eternal vigilance and price of liberty and is the final analysis only keepers are the people imbecility of men history teaches us always invites the impudence of power today we have had an enlightening session and fruitful discourse on justice khanna's journey i am grateful to our chief guest honorable mr justice vikram nath for delivering today's keynote address on behalf of the can foundation i express our heartfelt gratitude to justice vikram nath for gracing this occasion with his presence and words of wisdom i would also like to extend our gratitude to our panelists of the session senior advocate mr siddharth luthra and senior advocate mr neeraj kishan call for their contribution to the session and obviously mr tarik khan for moderating the session so beautifully i on behalf of the can foundation thank our co-hosts professor subbir k bhatnagar vice chancellor dr ram manohar loya national law university and professor ved kumari vice chancellor of national law university odisha I also take this opportunity to thank Heman Sahai Associates, Lakshmi Kumaran and Sridharan Attorneys, ELP and Phoenix Legal as our effort partners, Baron Bench as our media partner, SCC Online EBC as our knowledge partners for their invaluable contribution. Additionally, I would also like to thank Mr. Sumit Malik, Director of Eastern Book Company, for constantly support our foundation. I acknowledge the sincere efforts of the dedicated student members without whom this symposium would have not been possible they are the backbone of our foundation we cannot conclude this session without giving our thanks to the members of the legal fraternity to the viewers young scholars law students being with us i would request now everyone to join us for our post lunch session starting at 2:30 pm on the topic vox populi versus rule of law supreme court of india with our esteemed panelists presiding guest honorable mr justice jb pardiwala guest of honor honorable justice vikram nath and senior advocates shri nidesh gupta and shri siddharth bhatnagar thank you